chapter six, and this is over emotions. So first, when talking about emotions, I want to characterize what an emotion is and how it's different from moods. And I think that a lot of us use these words interchangeably um, when really there is a distinct difference between emotions and moods. So emotions are brief, specific responses, both psychological and physiological, that helps people meet goals, including social goals. goals. So I think obviously we know that emotions affect us psychologically because they change the way that we think, which we'll get into later, um, and, and, and the way that we feel. Uh, but how does it affect us physiologically, as in how our body works? So there are some physiological responses, some examples of them that accompany emotions, such as sweaty palms could happen whenever you're nervous or excited. Uh, maybe you are giving a speech up in front of your class or giving a presentation. Uh, tearing up. Uh, this could be whether you're really happy, you're really sad, you're angry, whatever it is. Um, sentimental, something could make you um, make tears well up in your eyes. Uh, blushing could happen because you're nervous, you're excited, you're embarrassed. Uh, goosebumps be could be because you're excited, because you're scared, because um, you're frightened. And um, these typically only last for seconds or minutes. And when I say typically is the, the definition is that they last for seconds or minutes, but there are times you could feel emotions for longer um, because maybe the situation you're in is, is lasting longer than that. So maybe you are always going to be a nervous public speaker and so you're, and your presentation is an hour long or two hours long, whatever it is, or you're in a play. And so it's two hours long. So you're feeling nervous. So that's going to obviously last longer than seconds or minutes, but it's not going to last days. Okay. So moods can last for hours or days. So the, the time difference between emotions and moods and how long they last, um, is the main difference between the two. So mood disorders, including depressions and generalized anxiety last for weeks, months, years. So it's not, it's not an emotional disorder. It's a mood disorder. So that being said, um, this is why I want you to take away, take away from the last slide is emotions are specific and have a focus. Uh, by contrast, moods and disorders are more diffuse and typically don't have a specific focus. It's like everything is wrong or um, this whole area of my life is going wrong or this whole area of my life is great. Whatever it is, moods and disorders um, are not from a single focus. Like you can experience um, the emotion of happiness because someone got you a present, um, but that is not going to make your whole day or your whole week um, in a good mood. It can maybe lift it a little bit, but um, by having a positive emotion, uh, but your emote, that one um, burst of emotions that can last for uh, seconds or minutes is not going to be the cause of the way you feel for the rest of the week. And that's what your mood is. And if you guys hear any um, weird noises in the background, my dog has been having the zoomies behind me. I just got home and she's very excited and she likes to show that by running back and forth through our house. Okay, so why do we even have emotions? What are the purposes of emotions? And so um, first, is that emotions help us interpret our surrounding circumstances. Uh, it helps us prioritize which events you attend to in an environment, um, the ones that make you feel strongly or that make you feel a certain way are the ones that um, are going to prompt you um, to doing something, to, um, to prioritize it. Um, it influences how much weight you assign them. Something that makes you feel stronger than something else is going to make, is going to elicit a stronger reaction. Okay. Um, it's going to determine how you reason about them. It's going to determine what you think about the event. Okay. And they affect whether you deem them right or wrong. There are some things that we know that they are right or they are wrong based on how we feel about them, about our emotions. Okay. Um, second is that emotions prompt us to act. So um, given that emotions prompt us to act, 
um, fear may cause us to act by running or by screaming or by fighting. So fear can prompt us to act into doing things. Okay. Sympathy can cause us to can prompt us to act by giving someone a hug or by doing something for someone because we have sympathy. Anger can cause us to want to make things right or can cause us to want to punch somebody. Um, emotions prompt us to act whether they're right or wrong. Gratitude can um, cause us to um, be kind to someone else, to thank someone else, to do something in return for them because you are feeling grateful. It can, it can prompt you to take care of uh, yourself or your home or those around you. Um, guilt can make you, can prompt you to do the right thing, can prompt you to confess, can prompt you to um, do something good to counteract the guilt you feel. Uh, there are lots of ways that emotions can prompt us to act, and that depends on the emotion that we're feeling. So, Dar so Darwin did have um, these thoughts about emotional expression and how um, maybe we all received our ability to express emotions from um, the same ancestors. Okay. So um, the print, he, he calls this the principle of serviceable associated habits. This is his idea that expressions of human emotion we observe today derive from actions that proved useful in our evolutionary past, that possibly um, expressing kindness to someone else is an evolutionary trait in order to get other people to help us or to gain friendships because back then it was better to have a friend than, a, than an enemy or competitor. A okay. couple of serviceable, serviceable associated habits is true, then all cultures should communicate and perceive emotion in a similar fashion. And we're going to talk about if that is or is not the case. And if that's also the case, then blind individuals will show expressions similar to those of sighted people because it's not whether or not they can see, it is, it's handed down evolution or evolutional. It is, um, okay, um, so, based off of the principle of serviceable, serviceable associated habits um, and how he said that it doesn't matter on the culture, we should all have similar uh, emotional expression. Well, that may not be the case. Um, it definitely changes from culture to culture. And that is what our journal is going to be about. So cultures seem to be defined by particular emotions. Uh, so we have uh, our focal emotions. These are emotions that are particularly common within a particular culture, um, kind of the, the emotion that a culture is known for. Um, so embarrassment and shame, these are emotions that convey modesty and appreciation of others' opinions. So um, if, if you are very concerned about what others think of you, it's easy to become embarrassed or shameful of something that you've done or said. Um, and these are core concerns of interdependent cultures. Of course, um, if you're more intertwined with people, if you're more part of a community, then you're going to be more uh, conscious of what others think of you, okay? Um, because you depend on them and they depend on you. So in the United States, excitement is greatly valued because it, en it enables people to pursue a cultural ideal of independent action and self-expression. So that is um, what would be considered maybe a focal emotion of the United States. Uh, and then there's also display rules. And this is um, a type of focal emotion. Um, it, it fits underneath focal emotions in that um, it, it really changes depending on the culture. Um, but this is a culturally specific rule that it governs how, when, and to whom people express these emotions. Um, so maybe you may feel happiness, but, or feel excitement, uh, but maybe in certain cultures, it's not polite or not, not deemed proper to, ex to display the, the giddy excitement that you may feel that maybe in the, in the United States, if we just won something, we may jump and down, jump up and down and squeal with joy and delight and 
um, we may go run and tell everyone about it and we're, we can be loud and boisterous, but maybe in another culture where why, while someone may feel that way, they may say inside, I can't believe I just won this. You know, I'm so excited. This is going to change my life. Uh, but to others in social settings, they may have to mask the emotion because it's not deemed proper. And so that's what the display rules are, is, is not just, it's not about what to feel, it's how to feel it and how to express it. Um, you may mask emotion, so you, um, you may uh, change it, or you may just neutralize it and have a neutral um, expression. So how do emotions um, affect social relationships? Uh, emotions prioritize the information we should focus on and factor into our decisions and actions. So um, say we are meeting someone new and the emotion we're feeling is uh, comfortable and happy and intrigued. Um, that would factor into our decision to maybe want to hang out with them some more. Um, maybe go, you know, maybe you're at a party and you decide to go um, go out to eat with them, uh, go get dinner, and then you're going to hang out. You're going to introduce them to your friends. Um, it's going to be a, a great time, and you can turn this uh, f feel this turning into some t some sort of friendship. Okay, um, but what if uh, during that same interaction? you're feeling kind of guarded and maybe a little creeped out and kind of uneasy, well, that is going to factor into, into your decision and actions of um, maybe you don't continue the conversation anymore or you cut it short or um, you don't really want to talk to that person again. Um, so emotions prioritize the information we, we should focus on is maybe the way I'm feeling is telling me how I should act, okay? Emotions also influence perception, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. Uh, we perceive events in ways that are consistent with the emotions we are currently feeling. And that brings us to the broaden and build hypothesis. This is the idea that positive emotions broaden thoughts and actions, helping people build social resources. So let's say you're walking into class, an in-person class. And you've just had a great day. You're in a, you, you are, you've been in a great mood for a few days. Um, just things have been going right. Uh, and you walk in and you know what, because you're in a great mood, you are more likely, uh, to participate in class. You're more likely to talk to people you've never talked to. Um, and, and because of that, that is also bringing on more positive emotions. So it's kind of like a positive cycle upwards that the more positivity you're bringing in, the more you, you are giving and the more you are receiving in your social life. Um, and so it is broadening and building your horizons. Okay, so what if you come to class and you've been in a negative mood for a few days, some bad things have happened, um, so you, you're feeling some negative emotions. Um, those tend to narrow your attention on the details of what you are perceiving. It's going to, going to cause you to um, view maybe even my class differently that um, maybe things are getting on your nerves. Maybe the people, um, friends or not friends in the class are annoying you with the comments they're making in class. You don't want to talk to anybody. You're probably not going to talk to anyone you haven't talked to before because you're just not feeling it. Don't, don't talk to me. Don't mess with me. Um, that is what the broaden and build hypothesis is saying is that whenever you're feeling positive emotions pos and you're in a positive mood, you're more likely to broaden and, and build your horizons by seeking out new things and um, by trying new things. But whenever you're, you're in a negative space, you're, you're going to narrow your options and not branch out. Okay, lastly is how emotions influence moral judgment. Um, I don't really want, really necessarily mind if uh, you pay attention to social intuitionist model of moral judgment. Um, there is an example of that that I really don't want to get into. Um, so you can look it up. You can, you can look up what that is on your own, but you're not going to be tested on it. But what I want to get on to uh, next is the moral foundations theory. And this is a theory that there are five evolved universal moral domains in which specific emotions guide moral judgments. And there's, there's five domains, okay? There's the care and harm domain. And um, 
this can lead to sympathy. So um, you are you are concerned about whether someone is being someone or something is being cared for or being harmed, and uh, you feel sympathy uh, towards you. You want this person or this thing to be uh, cared for. Okay, the second domain is fairness and cheating. Um, if someone if someone or something is being cheated, uh, the anger of that cheating fuels your passion for justice, okay? Um, the next is loyalty and betrayal domain. So uh, pride in something breeds uh, loyalty or loyalty breeds pride, either way. And betrayal fuels rage, okay? Uh, the fifth domain is authority and subversion. So uh, if you are in a place of authority, then um, you may be able to inflict embarrassment, shame, fear, um, may inspire pride and awe. And if you are subverted, if, if you are underneath someone, if, if you are sub someone, then you may feel embarrassment, shame, fear, pride in who is in charge of you and awe of who is in charge of you. Okay, and then there's the purity and degradation domain. Um, and if you are someone that cares a lot about purity, you, you will feel disgust if, um, if something has become impure, whether it's a belief, a thought, a, a person, a thing, wh whatever it is that you, you want it to remain intact, you want it to remain um, whole. Um, if it's not that way, then you will feel disgust. So typically um, in politics, uh, liberals are more concerned with the care harm domain and the fairness and cheating domains. Okay. And conservatives are typically more concerned with the loyalty and betrayal, the authority and subversion in the purity and degradation uh, domains. Okay. Uh, I think this is the last, yeah, the last bit. Um, and this is uh, predicting your emotions, okay? Uh, so one way you can you, we try to predict our emotions is through effective forecasting. This is predicting future emotions, such as whether an event will result in happiness or anger or sadness and for how long. And we are typically way off base. <laughs> we think, well, if we just get that next thing, if we just get um, save up enough money for that new car, um, we save up enough money for our first uh, designer purse, if we just do this, if we just get married, if we just do whatever, then everything is going to be perfect. My life is going to be, even if it's not perfect, it's going to be a lot better. We are predicting our future emotions, such as whether an event will result in happiness or anger or sadness and for how long. Uh, that new car that you buy is probably going to bring you happiness. The, the, the high you're going to be riding is going to be at most a week, maybe, I don't know. Um, my husband buys a and works on a lot of cars. We've bought old cars, we've bought brand new cars and it tapers off like the first, you know, couple days. Well, the first day you're really kind of riding high. It's like, I'm so happy with my purchase. And then, but then life goes on and over the next few days, it dwindles a little bit. And within a couple weeks, life is the same. Okay. So just because you think that life is going to be so much better once you have this, yeah, some things may improve your life, but your, the emotions you feel about it, you're not going to be in awe every time, every time you see that brand new purse or every single time you see that brand new car, just because you thought it would bring you happiness for a long time, it's not going to fix every other issue in your life. And so that's what effective forecasting is, is, is trying to predict your future, future emotions, but usually we are way off. Okay. Next is immune neglect. This is a tendency for people to underestimate their capacity to be resilient in responding to difficult life events, which leads them to overestimate the extent to which life's problems will, will reduce their personal well-being. So I know that this is a terrible thing to think about, but um, you see, you know, maybe single mothers, uh, widowed mothers um, with a few kids 
that, um, you know, maybe their husband died in a car accident or they were in the military and they died overseas or, or whatever it is. Um, you think, oh my gosh, I, I would be devastated. I would just want to sit in my, I would just sit in my room and cry and never leave my room for, for days or weeks or months. I would be completely useless. It, it would, it would hurt so bad. I couldn't even imagine that. And yes, while it may hurt a lot, um, it may affect you a lot, um, especially whenever you have some something else um, that it requires you to act, such as children or or another responsibility. Um, we we tend to underestimate our capacity to be resilient in responding to these life events. You know, whenever you think about maybe losing a spouse or losing a child or losing whatever, we just, we, we think about how heavy that would hit us. Um, not just emotionally, but, um, physically and socially and really every single aspect, but we fail to realize how resilient we are, especially whenever we have to keep moving forward because life requires us to do so. So by underestimating our capacities to be resilient, we're also overestimating the extent to which life's problems will reduce our personal well-being. Yes, it may hurt, but life will go on and uh, we will adapt. Okay. Last slide. Uh, is on focalism. And this is the tendency to focus too much on a central aspect of an event while neglecting the possible impact of associated factors or other events. Um, so this, this can kind of tie into effective forecasting is um, maybe my life will be perfect or be, will just be wonderful once I'm married. But you won't take into account that um, Perhaps um, you may have trouble conceiving children if you want children. Um, it may take a long time to afford the house that you want. Um, maybe you have a pet that dies. Um, maybe you have some family trouble. Um, maybe you um, are having trouble in your job. Um, while one part of your life may be great, um, we cannot focus too much on that one aspect of our lives and think that once we have that, everything is going to be great. Or if this happens, then everything will be absolute trash because we are neglecting the possible impact of other events or other factors that could affect that one centrally focused thing. Um, so you might be putting too much pressure on the one thing to maintain your happiness while the rest of your life is going on around you. So there's a study that was done that um, framed differently how people felt about their lives. So um, in this study, they, they asked a group of people um, the question first, how happy are you with your life in general on a scale of one to 10? And a lot of people would say, you know, six, seven, eight. And then they would say, how many dates have you had in the last month? And, you know, some of these people would say zero, some would say 10, so, you know, whatever. And those people typically had higher scores on the how happy are you with your life in general um, if they were asked the, the, the date question second. However, if they were asked the date question first, how many dates have you had in the last month? You know, someone may say zero or someone may say five or, you know, whether they went well or bad, whatever. Um, and they, they were asked the question second, how happy are you, are you with your life in general? Well, a lot of those people, because they then shifted their focus to the number of dates they've had in the last month and correlated it to how happy they are with their life in general, it dramatically changed their score from like an average of a seven to like a four. That's a huge difference. So really it, it, it all depends on what are we focusing on in our lives that affects how we feel about our lives. Okay, that is the end of chapter six, and I will be posting the journal uh, assignment also today, and is on the differences in emotional expression in different cultures.